Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. I have another delightful guest in front of us tonight. Uh, his name is Spike Cohen. He's a co-owner and podcaster of Muddied Waters Media, a political ad activist and entrepreneur. Cohen was the Libertarian Party's candidate for vice president in the 2020 presidential election. Um, he's agreed to talk to us today graciously with his time. Uh, prior to entering the public eye, he ran a successful web design company. He hails from Baltimore, Maryland, but currently lives in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Kiko. Thanks for having me on, man. I'm looking forward to it. I am too. And um, we didn't have a lot of time to sort of talk beforehand, but I'm just, um, since I've never met you before personally, I'm getting to talk to you now. Can you kind of tell me a little bit about um, where you're from? You grew up in Baltimore and sort of your mm -hmm. journey um, past, I guess, college. Sure. Well, I didn't go to college, so uh, we can skip that journey. <laughs> so my, my, my. Uh, so, uh, here, so yeah, I was born in Baltimore, but we moved to Myrtle Beach when I was a kid. My story is pretty simple. I, uh, as a teenager, I used to work during the summers. Uh, I learned uh, a lot there. I learned uh, the the value of money. I learned the value of working hard and working smart. I learned the value of networking. Uh, I was a 13 year old busboy getting tipped out because the waiters and waitresses liked me, and I learned that you know you can uh, you can network and make even more money. Uh, but the biggest thing I learned was I don't want to work for anyone else because I was. 13, 14 years old, I was fine washing dishes as a kid, mm -hmm. but I would see people two and three times my age doing the same thing as me, making maybe an extra 50 cents or a dollar an hour. And I thought, nah, that's definitely not for me. And so at the uh, right before my 17th birthday, I uh, started a web design company and uh, ended up uh, kind of growing that into a successful company, got involved in some other startups over the years as well. Uh, and then in 2014, I woke up and the right side of my body was going numb. Uh, fast forward two years later, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis oh, wow. and, uh, that kind of led me on a journey of realizing I had reached a point where I had made enough money that I didn't need to work anymore. And I needed to start thinking about what I was going to do now that I had grown up. Uh, mm -hmm. I was now in my thirties. Uh, I was, uh, I was making money, but it was a purposeless life, I, I would say. And uh, other than, you know, my my family and, and things like that, I wasn't serving a greater purpose. Mm -hmm. And I realized I was at the point where now I could start thinking about that. And uh, so that led me into uh, political uh, activism, libertarian activism uh, that I'm giving the, the very short version of a much longer story. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I decided in 2019 to run for the VP nomination for 2020, uh, did not expect to get it. I just really wanted to talk to them about what I, as an entrepreneur and business owner, was seeing as what I thought were some pretty glaring uh, uh, issues to be fixed with strategy and messaging and tactics and so forth. I guess I made a good sell of my idea because they ended <laughs> up just picking me for the VP nomination. And the rest is history, man. I've been out here uh, doing political activism across the country, just launched my organization, You Were the Power. And that's, yeah, that's, we're pretty much caught up to 2022 now. Okay. Before I get into um, the You Are the Power, um, sort of what that's about. Wh what made you so surprised by that selection by the Libertarian Party? Well, just that uh, I was a relative unknown. Like people okay. didn't really know who I was. There were some people who knew who I was in the party, but mm -hmm. there were much bigger figures who mm -hmm. were running for that nomination or who were running for the presidential nomination and were expected if they didn't win that to drop back because our, our system's different. We don't have our, we don't pick our uh, presidential candidate who then picks the VP candidate. That's what Correct. Republicans and Democrats, that's what most parties do. Our party does it the old school way, the way everyone used to do it. We pick our presidential nominee, and then the next day we pick the vice presidential nominee. So I actually mm. ran for that nomination. I expected that a much bigger, much more well-known uh, name in the party, uh, either that was running for the VP nomination or that was running for the presidential nomination and then would drop back for VP if they didn't win that, would end up getting it. So I just expected, I would say in the last couple of weeks, we, my team started doing like unofficial whip counts and stuff like that and realized I was probably going to get it. But up until that, I, I was, I, I just, you picture someone that has never run for anything before. He's mm -hmm. running to be the vice presidential candidate of the third largest political party in the country. That's and absolutely. he's, he's doing pretty well, you know, he's, you, you know, you're doing okay. But then, you know, at some point you think, okay, something's going to give, right? Like at some point they're going to pick the Somebody other guy else. or the mm -hmm. other person, someone else. And then, you know, a big, a big name would come in 
And I'd go, okay, that's it. That, that they're going to pick this. Nope. <laughs> and then they, they, something would happen with them where it looked like they weren't going to get it. And I go, okay, well, okay, but this guy's going to get it. And it, it was all the way to that last day where I'm like, uh, John, uh, a guy named John Mons, who's one of my heroes in the party, he had been running for the presidential nomination. He mm -hmm. didn't get it. So he dropped back to VP and I thought, okay, so this will be it. I will, I will lose to John Mons, the first libertarian to ever get a million votes. And it was in a statewide race. This is an incredible, pro you know, what a great, and I ended up winning and I still won. So yes, I was, I apparently did a good job selling my idea because I, <laughs> but I didn't, yeah, I didn't, I didn't expect it just because I was a relative unknown, honestly. Well, that's exciting because when I got first attracted to you, when I saw you're my age, I mean, you're actually, we're just a week apart in age. I just turned oh, wow. 40 July the 8th. Oh, and wow. I know yeah, you yeah, recently yeah, turned yeah. 40. And yeah, it's like 10 days apart. Yeah. I wish we had more representation like that, you know, right now running shit, you know, instead of the, what yeah. this, what we have right now, this circus that tends to go back and forth between the rotating letters, which I, if, people follow this podcast they know that i don't differentiate between the democrats or republicans the dem republicans and so um it's one of those things where i like to try to get some fresh air like even from you know ideological differences i still want to see is there anything outside of this duopoly whatever it is yeah, yeah. and i've been reading more about libertarianism it wasn't something that initially attracted me over the years because I was always skeptical. I was always taught things. There was like an old white man's club. Yeah. But the things that I followed recently completely contradict those notions. And so I've warmed up more and more to that idea. So what is the you are the power? What is that about? Is that something you created? Yeah, so you are the power is it's technically nonpartisan. We work with the Libertarian Party. We work with Democrats, Republicans, people that aren't even politically affiliated one way or another. But basically, the long and short of what you are the power is uh, there are in possibly in your city, in your county, in cities and counties across the country, there are hot button issues where the people there are fed up with something that their local government, you know, city council, county board, school board, whatever, either is doing wrong isn't doing or is doing and they don't want them to do. And it, there's almost a near consensus on this. Like everyone is upset about this, but, and there's a consensus around what needs to be done, but they don't know how to organize effectively to be able to stop it from happening. And they feel powerless to be able to do anything about it. That's where we step in. So what you are mm. the power is we have membership in all 50 states. We already have over 2000 members across the country in less than, uh, it was just about two-ish months ago, that just over two months ago that we launched. Uh, and we have thousands of members across the country. They find these hot button issues. Sometimes they're in their own city. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they're in their own town. And uh, what we do is we begin organizing immediately around that issue. Uh, we organize online. Uh, we do we we do what I call social media swarming. Basically, we put that local government on notice on their Facebook page, their Twitter, their whatever other social media they have. That draws even more attention. It gets the local media's attention. Uh, our on the ground uh, organizers start organizing uh, family friendly rallies that people can come to to try to call for whatever the thing is we're trying to get done there. We encourage people to flood their phone lines and their emails. So and then we show up to or membership and the the activists show up to the city council or school board or whatever it is show up to their meetings mm -hmm. and during the public comment which they're required to have tell them what they've already been hearing on social media on their voicemail on their email and now they're hearing it in person and so basically we we apply a full court press old school human organization full court press on these local governments that aren't used to this kind of pressure and get mm. them to do the right thing in doing so we expose people to libertarian ideas. And when I say libertarian, I don't mean the party. I mean the philosophy of libertarianism. Mm -hmm. We expose them to the idea that the problems that they're facing are because there's too much power in the hands of too few people. And that when we take that power and put it back in their hands, that's when good things can begin to happen. And mm -hmm. we solve people's pro We help people solve their problems right now. We help grow the movement as a result of it. We show people just how much power they do have. And we build a movement from that. And that's, that's the, that is the, the uh, sort of the the uh, the elevator pitch of what you or the power does. And so how do you apply that pressure locally? Like what what tends to work out um, if you can share that information? What does work out um, as far as pushing back against the local political machines? Uh, so the way it, so we so far we've had a 70 percent success rate. 
Okay. Um, which has been, I mean, we were hoping to get 50, 50 and mm-hmm. that was probably unrealistic. We've so far had a 70% success rate. Uh, and in fact, I'd say, I don't know an exact percentage. I should probably find out, but I'd guess maybe a quarter of the time we never even have to show up in person. Just us, you know, putting them on notice online is enough for them to back off. Uh, an example of that was, uh, in a place called bourbon, Indiana, there was mm. a lady who, uh, her house had burned down and her insurance company, while they were going through, because it takes a while to even start the process of building a house after, you know, they have to do the damages and figure out the cost and everything else. They gave her a temporary RV to live in on her property while her home was being built. The zoning board started fining her every day and threatened to uh, put her in jail if she continued having the RV on her property because they said that she was only allowed one residence on the property. Mm. Even though the first residence was burned down to the very foundation, they were doing that. So we found out about it. We basically, you know, went online and started notifying everyone what we were that we were going to call for them to back off and let her have her RV. And before we even had to organize anything in person, they backed off and let her uh, have the RV there. Also, because we raised so much awareness around it, people started uh, organizing to bring uh, her and her family prepared meals because it's hard to prepare meals in an RV, right? So mm-hmm. people were bringing her meals, bringing her baked goods, uh, bringing her anything that she needed for help. Uh, it actually spurred the insurance company to move faster and uh, so it worked out in the in everyone's favor also the additional attention led a judge to realize that the zoning board had met illegally and so that's now being investigated so that was all as a result of maybe i don't know a, a two or three days of our on the ground activists notifying us of what was happening and us organizing people and raising awareness online uh we've had other things where we have to get a lot more involved um, but you know, the long story is long story short is we stay involved until the, until we, we accomplish our goal and so, so far almost three quarter success rate. So you all are not technically a lobby. Uh, well, we know because we don't, so far we haven't done anything at the state or federal level. And that's okay. usually when it's considered lobbying. We are, I guess we're lobbying in the old school first amendment way of, uh, of, you know, first amendment protected citizens getting together and redressing their grievances against that's what it sounds like very like i like that the citizens like coming together it sounds very grassroots that's awesome it is a very very grassroots thing and it's so inspiring to to do i mean it's often we're showing up on some very very like terrible things that have happened but at the same time it's incredible how people will get together and uh, we'll see church groups coming out we will see you know soccer moms coming out we'll see the local head of the democrat party and the local head of the republican party and local libertarian activists are almost always there uh and uh you know we'll, we'll have people that heard about it on facebook and they bring their family to to uh, we've had a lot of uh homeschooling families that will bring their kids to our events And that Mm -hmm. becomes part of their education on like how, you know, how, you know, meeting with your local government works and things like that. And it's just incredible to watch it. It's, it is, it is pure. It is like the most, uh, the, the most, uh, I guess, grassroots level of civic activism. And uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, I guess, technically lobbying to the extent that it is people lobbying their local government, but right. it's not considered like a regulated Right, it's not like the D.C. Activity. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, <laughs> it's, not D, it's not D.C. or even state capital. Now, we may at some point get to a point where we start lobbying at the state level, but right now we're satisfied fight, focusing hyper-local, getting things done at the local level. If that works its way up to the state and federal level, so be it. But what I want to do right now, man, is empower people who don't realize the power they have. They think that all they can do is show up every year or two years or whatever it is in their area and vote for the same choices. You know, mm-hmm. you're talking about the duopoly. Imagine you're you're in a small town. It's just the same people running every time. Someone can run themselves, but you know, no one, they, they, they don't have the, mach- the, whatever tiny machine is running things there behind them. Here's the other part of that. Now that we've launched, now that we're officially in action, uh, and now that we're, you know, raising funds, getting a full-time staff and all of that, uh, what's happening now is that 30% of the time that we that they don't go do the right thing. Now we have built a multi-partisan base of support and mm-hmm. a winning platform for some of those activists to run for those offices themselves. They've right. already got everything they need because they already to have take the... over that city council. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's, more. that's the next step. We haven't gotten there yet. We're just now getting started on that. But uh, that's the next step. I want to get as close to 100% success rate as we can. That's very smart. I don't think we have enough of this for a reason. There's not enough of this grassroots organizing on the political level because we know 
the, the situation here tends to be um, comp a super capitalistic money machine. The higher you go up, is just all the lobbying that goes behind Cronyism. and the special yeah. interest. Yeah. Absolutely crazy yeah. stuff going on behind yeah. closed doors. Um, I wanted to talk before we get into, uh, I guess, sort of um, your individual philosophies, because they may differ from the public platform of libertarianism. Did the Libertarian Party start in the 70s? Yeah, so the Libertarian uh, Party proper mm -hmm. started in 1971. And it had been a up until that point, it had been a kind of a club or a group of people who had gotten frustrated with Republicans and Democrats. You know, this was during uh, Jim Crow that, you know, in the 50s and 60s, Jim Crow, the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, uh, how long it took to get any kind of civil rights. And the, the final straw, oddly enough, and it, it'll sound weird until I explain it. But the final straw for these people was when uh, Richard Nixon took uh, the U.S. off the gold standard by ending Bretton Woods. That was the final straw. And I know that sounds ridiculous, like the Vietnam War, the, the civil rights movement, all, mm. all of that. It was taking us off the gold standard. But if you look after 1971 is when you start seeing this decoupling that has been getting worse and worse over time, where the middle class and the upper class just completely separate. The mm -hmm. middle class starts slowly adjusted for inflation, starts slowly losing their wealth over time, while the upper classes just go through the roof. Uh, you start seeing uh, a massive increase in inflation. You start seeing a massive uh, uh, up and down to the boom bust cycle, which you know, anytime it goes up in a big boom and then comes down, that's millions of people's lives and livelihoods mm -hmm. being destroyed every time. All of that is because the money, and this is what libertarians understood in, in 1971 when it happened. Happen. Once the money is no longer tied to an actual store of value, once the government can decide at will through the Federal Reserve what money is worth or not worth, mm -hmm. once they can just print out trillions of notes, uh, then what happens is they can just flood the market with money, hand that money off to the cronies that put them in office and hand some of it to themselves. You have more money chasing the same number of goods and services, which mm -hmm. means that the price of everything goes up mm -hmm. and it doesn't bother them because they just got all that free money. We get stuck with the bill for it and with the cost increase. It's the most mm -hmm. insidious tax of all is inflation. And it happens as a result of that. They knew all of that was going to happen. The other thing that happens when you can uh, separate money from actual value is the government doesn't have to convince us that something's a good idea because if they want to go to, for example, be at war perpetually for the last 40 some odd years, like they've been <laughs> yeah. in the past, they used to have to tax us for it. And we'd mm. say at some point, we'd say, you know what, I don't like paying this war tax anymore. But if they can just print out endless notes and hand it to themselves and stick us with the bill for it, we pay it off 10, 20 years later with interest, don't even know what we're paying the, the wow. bill off for. It lets them, it allows the war machine, it allows the war on drugs, it allows the, the school to prison pipeline and the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. Everything that we have set up right now exists because the actual cost is something that's laid out later. It's like a layaway plan where we get the, the abuse now and then we pay for the cost of it later. None mm -hmm. of that would be able to make it if money was tied to value. So libertarians knew all of this was going to happen. And so that was the final straw. So they started the Libertarian Party in 1971. It was a protest movement. They would come in like 12th place if they ran for president. Some of our mm -hmm. first candidates got thousands of votes like it was they knew they weren't going to win right but it was it was just we are it was just them saying nothing no other party represents us the, the the republicans and democrats don't represent us uh these smaller parties at the time none of them represent us we need a party that is based on our libertarian ideas of non-aggression voluntary interaction and 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 uh you know um uh, uh, anti-authoritarianism that's that's what we're about and in the last 50 years we went from being a protest that was written on the, the original platform was written on a napkin. I mean, that's how, <laughs> that's how like the first libertarian party meeting was held in this guy's uh, living room in uh, uh, somewhere in uh, Vail, Colorado, it was like seven <laughs> people. And they're sitting there they're like, Oh, we formed the libertarian party and we're sick of all that. Like, I mean, that's, that's the fact. And in 50 years, we went from that to now we are really the only third party. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no other party besides the Republicans and Democrats that gets on all 50 state ballots or even 30 yep. of them. Uh, mm -hmm. There is no other party that's getting even 
250,000 votes, much less, you know, millions of votes at the presidential level. We're way behind the Republicans and Democrats, but then there's almost as much space between us and anyone else. So we are now at this point, we are the third party. We're, we're in a tier all to ourselves. I wish, and I'm not going to throw any parties under the bus, but I wish other political parties, I just put it that way, I wish that they would sort of have a better organizational approach an ideological sort of an angle, but I think the issue with these, um, because I do identify, I'm a leftist, like through and through, not a, not this fake blue Democrat stuff, but the the issue I see with some leftist parties that are third parties is that they um, almost stray away from the principles that kind of got them there in the first place. And I feel like a lot of the libertarians that I talk to are pretty consistent in what exactly their principles are. And I think a lot of the people who do identify on the left spectrum, they argue so much about certain things. And it's like, but at the end of the day, it's like, what are your philosophies? Like, what is your bread and butter? And yeah. what I see consistently from libertarians is like um, anti-war, um, very much um, economically sound when it comes to this gold standard and this fiat currency mess and just yeah. this printing the money off like crazy. Um and maybe for you personally, I've noticed you advocate for it more than a lot of other libertarians. You are very outspoken against the police state. Like I've followed you for a while and just your social yeah. media presence about just covering these issues. What What is the Gastonia, North Carolina situation with Gastonia, the homeless yeah. veteran? Yeah. Um, we, make, we can talk about that some. But where would your views um, personally sort of conflict a little bit with the larger libertarian party platform or are they just lots of divergences across the board or are you pretty much in line with what the national platform is uh there is nothing there is nothing that i advocate for or against that isn't basically 100 percent in line with the libertarian party platform um i will say this um there are certainly differences of opinion among libertarians um, and also differences in priority. So, for example, mm -hmm. uh, my big things are you can't start talking about any of the other changes that need to be made to government if at any point an enforcer of the government can just come and put a bullet in your head and nothing happens to that person. They aren't held accountable. Like if your Second Amendment doesn't matter, it doesn't they even can matter. just kill you. Your mm -hmm. First Amendment doesn't matter if if uh, an agent with a hair up their butt uh, of government can just literally come and and blast you or beat you up you know, wrongfully arrest you, run up a bunch of phony charges and run you through the prison system and over criminalize you for something you didn't do and not be held accountable, not even be held accountable for it afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that is one of my main focuses. I would say my probably right up there with that is the economic end of it. You can't truly deal with the government uh, if it can just print out fake money and mm. force you to pay the the interest on it because it's like playing a game of monopoly where oh, we're playing with three people yeah. you and i are playing by the rules right but you know we're, we 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 do our turn we roll the dice whatever and then when it's it's this third guy's turn he goes to the banker and says give me a trillion monopoly notes and stick them with the bill for it who's going to win that game exactly right like it's not even <laughs> not only will he win that game we won't even be able to play it at a point because we our money's worth nothing like the our our three thousand dollars we've been hoarding there's mm -hmm. nothing on the board that we'll be able to buy which means that guy owns us now so those right. are two of my main focuses but in terms of like my thoughts on guns on health care on civil rights on on any of these things they're pretty much orthodox libertarian positions i personally there are many different schools of libertarianism mm -hmm. i come from what's called the anarcho-capitalist school i'm an okay. anarchist who believes in a fully free market society um and so i definitely am, am i guess one of the more edgy libertarians from that perspective. <laughs> uh but uh but uh which is another reason why i thought i'm like they're gonna pick an ancap for their their vp but anyway um <laughs> i uh but uh in terms of like there's not really anything that i say where people are like no that's not what libertarians believe there may be some libertarians that disagree with it or the priority of it but no that's this i'm i'm pretty much through and through if i say something it probably is pretty reflective of what the libertarian party platform is on that thing wow that's that's pretty eye-opening it's funny i just got done talking with um an anarchist uh before you but on the completely different side of the spectrum yeah, yeah. but speaking of spectrums and this is something that i think confuses a lot of people um and maybe categorization is just a big problem as it is but because we do make a big deal about these um teams and 
um, this herd mentality. It's like, and a lot of these people are well um, meaning people. They're good people, but they sort of get misguided because they follow the corporate news narratives. And, right, and so right, they right. become a part of the team. Even though I identify with the left, that can mean a lot of different things to different people. It's hard for me to look at the options during these um, local elections and the national election. It's just like this 2020 past election. Yeah. The Libertarian Party platform is more left than the supposed left party, the Democrats. And at least from my perspective, just from some of those important issues about um, the police state, when the Democrats are funding the police state just like the Republicans are, or at yeah. least openly advocating for the funding of it, while these people are saying, no, we need to de-escalate this situation here, we need to end the wars, it's like you all are doing exactly things that some of my left comrades would be on board with. What right, would you right. respond to as far as that's concerned? So what I like to say is the libertarians are are better uh, here's how i word it tell the right, right. libertarians <laughs> are better than the left on the things that the left tends to care about and we're okay. better than the right on the things the right cares about so for example you brought up police brutality the police state the war on drugs uh uh the the systemic racism behind disproportionate enforcement and and disproportionate sentencing and all of that I, i'd say the libertarian party is certainly better than the democrats even pretend to be on that i mean oh even no the, doubt <laughs> even the even the rhetoric from the Democrats isn't as good as ours. And mm -hmm. then they go and pick Joe Biden, the architect of the police state and Kamala Harris, one of its most ardent enforcers, right? As a, as a prosecutor. Here you have Kamala Harris. And you know we talk about virtue signaling and that term gets overused way too often, but they literally picked her and said, look, we picked a black woman. Yeah. Now let's ignore, <laughs> let's ignore that this black woman, first of all, used to not refer to herself as black, but let's, of course. let's, let's, <laughs> let's she, she's a Caribbean Indian, but now she's black. But anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, but also that, and honestly, that's whatever your identity is, that, 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 here's what matters. There were two me black men, one of whom thankfully is out of death row, one of whom is still in death row because she illegally withheld exculpatory evidence in their trials. Mm -hmm. That's disqualifying to me. Like that, that's someone that should arguably be in jail herself. Forget mm -hmm. her running for dog catcher, much less. Absolutely. BP. And yet mm -hmm. we hear, well, but she's a black woman. Okay, fantastic. This particular black woman put two black men in prison, put in death row, for crimes that she had evidence that they knew that she knew that at the very least they couldn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they did it. And in one case, it was flat out that they, they couldn't. It actually took a judge ordering her office to release everything they had. And they were finally able to get the, the guy out of death row. But that's that's who we're talking about here. So that's obviously when it comes to the war on drugs, uh, the war on sex work, uh, immigration, I would say that we're better than the than the Democrats certainly even pretend to be now. On, oh, I know you example, are. I know you are <laughs> on the on the things on the right. So, for example, like we are gun rights maximalists, absolutists like and frankly, if you go far enough left, you get your guns back. So that, oh, might, yeah, be, yeah, yeah. that, that might be I somewhere heard you all say that of the Reed Coverdell uh, podcast. Yeah. I was listening to yes. it. someone. I think you said that. As well. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, if you go far <laughs> enough left, then you're back with like the Black Panthers and the Huey P. Newton Gun Club, and then you get your guns back. So, that, and I'm good with that. But you know, mm -hmm. uh, the right uh, pretends to support our right to keep and bear arms. Well, unless a cop shoots you for having a gun, or you know, you have a, a you know, uh, you use cannabis uh, for medicinal reasons, right. or have a misdemeanor from six years ago, uh, or you're not a citizen or, you know, any myriad of reasons they can come up with to justify taking away your right to keep and bear arms. Um, you know, we are maximalists on that. No, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed means exactly that. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean there's no asterisk. And even if there was, I wouldn't care because my rights aren't defined by a sheet of paper written by people that died 200 years ago. <laughs> it's defined by the fact that we exist as human beings and have an errant inalienable right. So that's the that's that's where we are better. And, you know, things like uh, taxes and things like that, we're better than the right on that. I think wh where it can sometimes get confusing on where it seems like we're really left on some things and really right on other things. I actually see it as us remaining consistently libertarian. Mm -hmm. And the times when it appears that we're left, it's actually when people on the mainstream uh, or even on just the general left 
are finding themselves being more libertarian about a certain subject. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, you know, where it looks like we're more right, that's a time when someone on the right perceived them, you know, found themselves being a little bit less authoritarian and a little bit more libertarian on that issue. I tend to believe even on those issues, we're better than them even on those things that we agree on. But, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's a philosophical thing. I am willing to work with anyone, almost anyone, that agrees with me on even one thing. Because mm -hmm. if you think about that, I mean, you can think about some pretty egregious people out there, but we can, those people are going to exist regardless. I can either oppose them in all ways because they don't agree with me enough, or even if there's literally only one thing that I agree with them on, I just leveraged my opponent mm -hmm. to help pass something that you know that i support that that person also happens to support so i'm a big believer in building coalitions i'm a big believer in, in having as big of a tent as possible i you know i i do believe that you know we as individuals and as a party and and, and all of us should remain as consistent to our beliefs we don't water down what we believe but we can be willing to suspend and say listen you and i and i'm come here. no you're fine it's all good no i i have a, a <laughs> my my wife is fostering this come here please there is this little teacup poodle, and he usually is quiet. Do you mind if I just have this dog in my lap? Because no problem. No, my previous guest okay. actually had pets as well okay. in the background, so it's no big deal. I never have this problem, but this you you he has been having. Oh, this is Ross. <laughs> this is Ross, Hi. and uh, he is uh, he is being a very annoying dog today. But anyway, um, so. You know, there are, like you said, there are probably many things that we disagree on, whether it's healthcare, it may even be guns, uh, or it could be no, it's, it is, we'll, we'll get to that just briefly, but just to sort of, um, so, so the audience can kind of understand the different angles of, um, these philosophies. But, um, we agree with a lot more than disagree, but I actually identify yeah. with libertarian and left. I identify with both. Yeah. Well, there is a libertarian left. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fact, a little history lesson: The original libertarians were actually uh, leftists. Mm -hmm. uh, so Proudhon and uh, uh -huh. uh, even Bosch, even Bastiat, who really was more of a classical liberal than a leftist, he was considered on the left. In fact, the original left was the side of the French Parliament that was against the king prior to the mm. revolution. So the original, even the classical liberals like like uh, like Bastiat and others, they were technically on the left side of that uh, of that of that aisle because they were they were anti. Um, they were against the crown. They were mm -hmm. against the, the, the king of, of, of France. But uh, but yeah, no, I mean, the, the roots of libertarianism are actually from the left. Uh, and it was later on that, you know, that there was this more propertarian concept of libertarianism from the, the, the classical liberal um, mm -hmm. tradition like John Locke and so forth. But the reality is there is so much overlap. If there you're is. a libertarian, there is so much overlap. And even on the things, and we can get into these, even on the things that we may disagree on, there's a lot even within that that we agree on. Mm -hmm. um, and I I tend to, you know, I'm, I am I come from a background of trying to build coalitions to get things done. Uh, it used to be in the business world. Now I'm doing it in politics. And, and the reality is, man, you're not going to find anyone that agrees with you 100%. You're lucky to find anyone that agrees with you 90%. So if you can find someone that agrees with you on a lot of things or even on a few things and you can work together, let's get that stuff done and we can argue about other stuff later. I am 100% on board with that. And you answered my question already. So you obviously believe in coalition building. I do too. Yes, 100%. And I get excited yeah. when people talk like that because it is bringing people together. And um, this whole code word of divisiveness it can be used easily to weaponize people and just discourage people who 100%. you know do want to you know join and i'm discovering that more and more if i can just take my emotions out just a little bit and maybe consider like okay maybe the initial blow may hurt my ego some but if we <laughs> want to really work together we have to actually talk dialogue strategize yeah. together we can't do it in separate rooms and so I'm all about coalition building. And I've seen a lot of that happening. I think the end of wars, were you a part of that? The end of war, the end of damn wars rally? In the damn wars, yeah. I, I spoke at one of their rallies. Uh, and that was a, a big coalition. It was. Of, uh, mostly various stripes of anarchists. It was. But there were, but there were, <laughs> there were, but there were other libertarians there and, and other just anti-war people. Uh, uh, the rally I went to in D.C., there were a few people there that were like kind of like, 
uh, Trumpy type, almost nationalist type, but they're against the wars. They yeah, against the, the wars. War. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. They're against the wars, and they weren't they weren't like Nazi or alt right or whatever. But they had their their MAGA hats or whatever. Right. And they were like, you know, we need you know we need to worry about our own country. And it's like, yeah, you're actually right. We should not be bombing other countries. We mm-hmm. should be worrying about. And they one of the things they said was, you know, we got all these vets coming home all banged up, and there's no reason for it. Yeah, hundred mm-hmm. percent. I, there was yes. nothing I disagreed with on why they were against the war. So exactly. no, you got to build coalitions with people. And the thing is, there are people out there that agree with you and may not even realize it. How are mm-hmm. you going to find that out? How are they going to find that out if you aren't talking with them? Right. Like, there are so many people that have joined the liberty movement in, in the time that I've been uh, active in it because we may have agreed on just one thing. And over time, you know, we're, we're around each other more, we're working together more. And they realize, you know what, actually, I agree with you on that too. And I agree with you on that too. There's a phrase I like to use, the more you can get someone into your orbit, the more you can affect them with your gravity. And (laughs) my, my idea is the more that you can bring people in to what you're about, the more they at least understand it. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to agree with all of it, but they at least have a perspective of where you're coming from. You are no longer this, this caricature or abstraction of someone who disagrees with them. You're a living, breathing human being who they know cares and, and who they know is a good person. And then they they at least get where you're coming from and they may end up finding out they agree. How, um, I did want to talk some um, about healthcare because we yeah. may have some disagreements about that, but um. Mm-hmm. I wanted to talk about the idea of coalition building within the electoral process uh, when it comes to voting, because you know how a lot of voters are, the casual is, it it seems to only matter once the election gets closer and closer, locally and statewide and nationally. But I was thinking more so on why don't people protest vote more in the sense that um, the D and the R, you don't want to vote for either one but why not support the L or the G or whatever other letter there is? Yeah. Why why do those people feel so coerced to go back and fall back in their safe place and vote D or R at the end of the day when yeah. they could just easily vote for another letter? Did they just do you sort of have that issue with people you talk to? They want oh, to, to vote libertarian, they want to vote green or whatever it is, but they just can't put themselves to doing it. Yeah. It happens a lot. Um, during the campaign, I would hear it all. People would come out to my events, cheer every single thing I said. They would, you know, I do Q and A at all my events. They'd ask questions. They loved every answer I gave, and they'd say, "But wow. you know what? We've got to stop Donald Trump, or we've oh got to God. stop, or, or 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 Joe Biden will destroy this country." And it's and 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 they are, in many cases, some of them were even registered libertarians. But here's what happens, man, and I see it over and over again. A lot of people still haven't figured out that, and and sounds like you call them the Dem Republicans. I call them the Republicrats. The same thing. <laughs> uh, it, it, same is, thing. it is it is it's same thing. It is it is a system that is designed to look like it is opposed to itself in order to create a theater of opposition. You don't have to. It's not really difficult to see that when it's time to raise that debt limit so they can run up more debt in mm. our name to pay off all the cronies that put them in office. They do it in record time. They don't even debate on it. When it's time to <laughs> give away another several hundred billion or now trillions of dollars to corporate crony interest, multi-billion dollar multinational corporations who we know. I mean, we have the open records. They own these politicians. They bankroll oh, their campaigns. Open when secrets. it's time to do that, when it's time for them to do that, they do that. They don't even spend any time even talking about it. They just get it done in behind closed doors, vote on it quickly, and it's done. All of this other stuff, is theater of opposition. Mm -hmm. And it's designed to have us think that they're fighting each other. It's also designed to keep us fighting each other and to encourage you to, you know, now your neighbor across the street who disagrees with you on healthcare is now your mortal opponent because you have been (laughs) conditioned, uh, and I'm not saying you, but these folks have been conditioned Mm -hmm. that they have to stop them. So very often when people are voting against Trump or against Biden or against Republicans, or they're actually voting against this schmuck that lives down the road that they know has the wrong thoughts. And and it just, (laughs) it bleeds into how our our entire discourse in this country, and it's intentional. It is divide and, it is Mm -hmm. pure divide and conquer. Um, What it really comes down to is they still think that this person's lies are better than this person's lies. And that comes from the good cop, bad cop routine 
Does it ever feel like, I know you're more on the left. Does it ever feel like a Republican will say something and it's like they're trying to piss you off? Oh, yeah, yeah, no doubt. We, okay. we actually talked about this with Margaret Kimberly yesterday. She, oh, okay, she, good. He explained the good cop, bad cop. She used yeah. that analogy, the exact same yeah. thing. Yeah. They are trying to piss you off. <laughs> and here's why. And there are plenty of times, I mean, I get pissed off by both of them, but, you know, yeah, I, I I, there too. are times... You know, it, it, I'll watch Joe Biden say something or I'll watch Kamala Harris or, or AOC or someone say, and I'm like, they want me to be angry at them. And here's why. <laughs> here's why. Here's what happens, Kiko. No one's had, like, even Trump's biggest supporters know that he has failed them a bunch of times. Of course. They know that he was, yeah. it was his CDC that did the lockdowns. Like, the mm -hmm. thing they're the most upset about, he did it. Yeah. Joe for Biden sure. support. No one likes Joe Biden. Like, Trump's I've VAX. Everyone, Complained about oh, God. the VA accent. Mad about I'm saying that. myself, wasn't he the one? Didn't he get it and everything? And then you guys are Told it's them crazy. To get it. And Told they just weaponized that like crazy. Weaponized that like crazy. Joe <laughs> Biden is like, I mean, the 94 crime. Joe Biden once said that he wasn't in favor of desegregation because he didn't want his children to grow up in a racial jungle. A racial jungle. Now, yeah. Now, now, yes, that was the 70s or 80s or whenever he said it. But every policy he has reeks of I don't want my children in a racial jungle. Here he is. He's locking up every black man he can find that's ever possessed any substance he doesn't like. Mm -hmm. And yet his son is literally weighing crack on the Internet and, and gets no trouble at all. Like This is <laughs> this is pure racial jungle uh, in, in, in play here. And keep um, in mind, Spike, before you continue, me and you, we're not black either. Neither one of us are. You know, no, you're because I, we didn't I, vote I, for him. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot all about that. I forgot all about that. I am so sorry that you had to lose your blackness in such an unfortunate way. Goodness. I mean, you think all the ways you could lose your 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 blackness in you know, an election. Wow. Um, perfect example. He got away with saying that. I cannot believe that. Yeah. On the Breakfast Club. Mm hmm. Like. <laughs> but so, but here's why he gets away with doing that. And here's why Trump gets away with what he's doing, because then they get to lean in and go, but if you don't for, get, vote for me, you're going to get that guy. You're going to get you that guy way more than me. Mm -hmm. It's good cop, bad cop. And that's really what it comes down to. And that's, I realized uh, over the last two years, I used to get frustrated and I would talk to folks and they'd say, well, I'd vote for you, but you can't win. And I'd say, I'd win if you voted for me. Like I'd have these same <laughs> conversations over and over again. And then I realized something. I come from a sales and marketing background. Like that's, you know, my company was all about me selling my products and services and, and all that. You don't argue with the customer. You figure out why they don't like your product or what's keeping them from, what, where, is, where the, the, the yes is being blocked. And then you figure that out. Where the yes is being blocked is that people, most people don't see voting in this case, libertarian, but you could apply this to any third party or independent. They don't see the risk as being worth the potential reward. Mm, I hear that so from liberals all the time. <laughs> you have to look at what's causing that. And you have to not just know it, but address it. A big part of what I'm doing with You Are the Power is I am tying, and again, when I say libertarian, I, I don't mean necessarily the party. I mean just libertarian, a, a candidate or an idea that is liber small l libertarian, a, a philosophically libertarian. I want them to see libertarianism not just as the solution, but I want them to tie it to winning. Mm -hmm. So when we have 70% success rate, we're able to you know, help all these people. We don't even have elected officials in that city or that county, but we're still able to effectively lobby or, or you know, I like to call it cyberbullying, even though we're not bullying them. But you know, we, we basically swarm on them and get them to do the right thing. I want people to associate liberty and freedom with winning and not just us winning, but them winning. Mm -hmm. And what happens there is now, instead of the good cop, bad cop, well, if I don't vote Republican, I'm going to get Democrat, or if I don't vote Democrat, I'm going to get Republican. Instead, it becomes, I don't care if I get Republican or Democrat. This is all I want, and I think they got a shot. Mm -hmm. That's when you can change things. Libertarians have won hundreds of elections across the country. They're mostly at the local level. When mm -hmm. those races have been won, it's been because the people in that city looked at that candidate and said, you know what? I'll give him a shot or I'll give her a shot. And then what happens is when a libertarian gets elected, they almost always get reelected for two reasons. Number one, people like what they do. And number two, no one wants to lose to a libertarian. Mm. No, 
no one, no self-respecting Democrat or Republican trying to work their way up the political ladder wants mm. to lose a city council race to a libertarian. Like, yeah. no, they, like that's like death knell for your career that you lost to a third party candidate. And uh, so once we get our candidates in there, they almost always are in there for as long as they want to be because a people like what they're doing and B no one wants to run against them and lose. So that's really what I'm trying to do with you are the power is grow a culture of liberty mm -hmm. that is so pervasive that it doesn't matter who gets elected. Like okay. right now, it doesn't matter who gets elected because the statists and the authoritarians are in control. The the so-called, I don't even like calling it the progressive movement because it's not really progressive, but it's what they, they call it the progressive movement. But it's really, we know what it is. It's the authoritarian, corporatist, croniest, neoliberal movement. That's it's all it is. So much, yeah. It's in the, the neocon neoliberal movement. And it's so pervasive at a cultural level that it doesn't matter if a Republican wins, Democrat wins, independent wins, they're still going to get their way because culturally people are scared. Mm -hmm. They think government's going to bail them out. And they think that too much freedom is dangerous. If okay. we're able to change that so that people realize just the opposite, that it's actually dangerous for government to have this kind of power and that freedom is the solution. Now it won't matter who wins because they're just going to demand freedom. That's mm -hmm. what my focus is. Let's grow this movement so much. It doesn't even matter what party wins, man. Like I'd love for it to be the Libertarian Party. I'd love for the Green Party to get more votes too, frankly. I tell people all the time, if you don't agree with me, vote Green then. Like that's See, that's I was going to like, get at that. Why don't people do that more? It's just like... um. But see, I've seen some issues locally. You say there's 50 state um, assets for a Libertarian Party. Um, is that just nationally or are there issues on the local level? Because I've seen some things where in New York, I think some of the Libertarians were get, got kicked off of the ballot and the Greens and yeah, yeah. Howie they're, Hawkins, they're, I uh, think, even got kicked off of the ballot. This the, And so is that, is yeah. that going to be a problem, though, if, if Libertarians it could get too elevated? In 2022, in 2020, they or 2020 or 2021, basically after Larry Sharp got on the ballot uh, in 2018, and him and Howie Hawkins got way higher. I mean, it was still single digits, but they got way more than anyone expected them to get. Then what happened was the the New York Democratic Party, with the help of the or at least with the uh, agreement of the Republicans, but the Republicans in that state they don't need their agreement. Their Democrats are in charge. But the New York <laughs> Democrat Party, the New York Democrat Party, did what the Ohio Republican Party did and just started kicking off everyone off the ballot. They ratcheted up the rules so that it was basically. It, they essentially made it illegal not to be a Democrat or a Republican running for mm. office, or, or so legally prohibitive that it wasn't actually possible and so they're actually suing they're suing to get on the ballot uh the there as last i heard the court is still weighing it several days later the longer it takes them to decide the better the odds are in our favor usually within an hour they come out and go yeah you're okay we, we weren't really listening we're just going to do what the democrats say mm -hmm. but uh it, it so it's i'm hoping for the best but yeah the 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 way that the republicrats respond to us actually getting some traction is just kicking us off the ballot which is yet another reason that my focus is on growing a culture of liberty because it may be it may very well be man that as you know libertarians greens third parties as they grow that the republicrats should just keep ratcheting up the pressure so that they can't even get on the ballot that may very mm. well be the case and there's not a tremendous hell of a lot we can do about it because they control every lever of power which is why my focus is cultural if you create a culture that cannot be ignored then a they're going to have to run on our platform if they want to win and mm -hmm. b we'll eventually replace them and undo all that nonsense they've done on the ballot um, mm -hmm. But it, it, we really we focus a lot on politics and I forget who originally said it, but all politics it, or culture is downstream of politics mm -hmm. uh, or no politics is downstream of culture. You have to affect the culture and then the culture will play out politically as a political block. That, mm -hmm. That's how it works. And so, yes, we're doing political action uh, and we're also doing like charity stuff. We're doing all sorts of things, but it's all built around the ideas that. Look at the good that happens when we work together voluntarily and look at the bad that happens when people get to just force their opinions on us and we keep mm. laying that out. And, and as we do that, we get victories. So they see libertarianism as making the most sense. 
They see it based on a concept of human respect. They see that it actually works and they see that we can win. And that's what's needed to grow a, a, a culture that attracts people, that makes people want to be a part of it. Our And the other big part of a culture of liberty is that it you do not have to give up. So like, for example, uh, there's this idea of like, we need to just have American culture. But American culture increasingly feels like this like homogenization, like you mm -hmm. have to give up aspects of your identity in exactly. order to be a yeah. real American. Oh, right? yeah. Like <laughs> you, you have to vote for Joe Biden if you want to stay black. I, you know, I'd make the rules. It is what it is. But but the uh, uh, I had forgotten he said that. What a mess. Uh, oh, guys, he's terrible. The, uh, I really I really don't know why my friends don't see it. And it's really an insult because I can't even talk to them about it. It's just I'm like, I know you guys did. I'm not going to hold you guys like accountable for that i know you yeah, both yeah, 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 you're gonna yeah. do but it's just like yeah. don't come at me like with this like aggression when i'm like no i'm justified and i'm not supporting that no, message if you want to do it don't put it on me don't put that on me exactly <laughs> but you know the the uh i forgot what we say oh the the so culturally the culture i am building of liberty it is a culture that transcends identity it transcends nationality it transcends every aspect of, of who you in, intrinsically are as a person. It is based on the idea that you as an individual, you own, for lack of a better word, own yourself. You have total autonomy over yourself. And that you you that is a society that respects your autonomy as a human being, that respects your individualism, that respects your ability as an individual to make decisions for yourself. That is a society that creates the kind of space that we need for us to be able to work together voluntarily. A lot of times people see individualism as this idea that each one of us is an island and we're all out, you know, we're all in it on our on our own. And, you know, we're all we're, you know, not, none of us are, are in this together. That's that's not individualism. Individualism is the respect for your intrinsic autonomy as an individual with the understanding that we are a social species and that only through recognition of each person's individual autonomy can we truly voluntarily work together and create solutions to the problems that we face. That That's really the core of libertarianism is, is an idea of mutual human respect and the 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 owing and tolerance and non-aggression towards one another, whether we agree, disagree or anything else, with the idea that that then allows the space for us to work together when it's time to, when we when we can work together. Before we conclude, I wanted to get a couple of questions in about sure, sure. Um, sort of where we diverge some. Sure. And so being a libertarian, do you see any sort of function for government as far like what should the government do? I guess um, what is the function of government, I guess, would be the question as far sure. as providing sure. services and whatnot. Like, is there any value to that or is it just um, pretty much? you know, organize individually? Yeah, so there are two main schools of libertarian thought on what the, the proper role of government is. Um, the, I guess, minarchist or classical liberal one, I'll give that first. Uh, the idea is that, that a government, uh, it's the only way that it can truly, first of all, we have to go back to the idea of we can't confer a right or a power to someone else that we don't ourselves have, right? Like I can't okay. rob you. I'm not allowed to rob you because that's wrong and it's it's not right to hurt people or to take from them. Well, that means I can't then confer that right to someone else because if it could, then if you take that to its logical conclusion, I can just hire someone to murder someone and that's fine because I didn't do it. I just conferred that to someone else. So consistently, in order to stay consistent with our belief on how human beings should interact with each other, that means that the only proper function of a government is to operate within the uh, consent of the governed and to operate only in the protection and enforcement of our lives, our rights, and our labor and the product of our labor, which is our property. That's that's really the, the purpose of government is defending life, liberty, property, and, and your rights, basically. Um, and when I say property, I mean like what you have, the things that you have earned and that you own. Okay. Um, so that that's the idea behind that. And we can get into the idea of but the, the problem with having them provide services is that you have an organization that is basically a, a in agreed upon or not even agreed upon monopoly of violence, who is funded mm. by theft and is enforced through violence and threats of violence, who is now operating as like a charity too, kind of. Mm. And all of the built in 
motives for an organization like that are actually towards hurting people, not helping them. And so mm -hmm. the, the classical liberal argument is that if you're going to have this tool that can hurt people, it should only be used to basically stop people from harming others, that it should really just be a, a defense tool uh, for the, the, the lives and rights and, and property of all of us. I, as an anarcho-capitalist, believe that the proper role of government is to be put in like a toilet or a, <laughs> or, or a, a shredder or something that you can then crush it and make it go away. Um, I, I believe... I believe, and I shouldn't say government. I should say the state. Right, because I know what you're saying. I get, I you get. You can what actually you're have you can have a voluntary form of governance where that doesn't have taxation that allows you to opt out. That you know uh, allows for there to be competing providers for the services we need and things like that. So that would still be a a government. It just wouldn't be a state. Um, here's here's an example of how I would give for that, and 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 we can go straight into healthcare because that's that's one of the big ones, right? Mm -hmm. Um. You, we may, uh, you, you know, call me crazy, uh, but I think that our current system is set up to maximize the profits for a handful of multi-billion dollar corporations. I agree. Intentionally so. It is mm -hmm. intentionally designed to make healthcare as expensive as possible and to drown out smaller competitors to protect the large crony corporations who help to bankroll the campaigns of the politicians. So, okay, good. So we're on the same page so far. We are. No, we, we definitely are. And, and this is a system, you know, we talk about the death panels or whatever. This is a system where a lot of people end up dying because they can't get access mm. to care or they can't get access to care quickly enough. Uh, I, I remember when I was diagnosed with MS and it took me the better part of a year to get on the, the treatment that I have right now. And thankfully I was able to get on it. I've been in remission for five years now, but that was a scary year, man. Mm -hmm. And there are others who are less fortunate than me uh, who are in a much worse place because of that. The, in the United States, our government spends more money on uh, of taxpayer money on health care per patient than almost any other country on earth. So for the people who say, oh, we have a free market, set, no, we don't. No, we don't. We have a government managed system. The difference is our government managed system is literally set up to be as expensive as humanly possible. Mm. Now, here's why that is. Our uh, healthcare system is built on the insurance system. Mm -hmm. And the insurance system is something, insurance is a useful tool to prevent catastrophic or unforeseen things and to insure against them. We don't actually have that. We have comprehensive insurance, which is basically a pooled bill paying mechanism. It is the worst way to determine how to pay for something because now the doctors don't have to worry about what you can afford. Mm -hmm. They have to worry about the provider. Deliver. They're figuring out what the multi-billion dollar organization that mm -hmm. gets everyone's premiums can afford, which means they can charge more Then they can get the politicians to pass stuff like certificate of need laws, cost plus legislation, redlining for the, for, you know, uh, uh, moratoriums on building any new facilities, uh, bans on being able to, uh, uh, import drugs, uh, import generic drugs into the US, uh, ridiculous patent protections for drugs like insulin, things that have mm -hmm. been around longer than any of, us, any of us have been alive. All of that comes from the insurance system, which the only reason we even have a comprehensive insurance system is because uh, in during World War II, uh, FDR threatened wage caps uh, to try to keep the cost of the war effort down because it, there were so few people that were the, the, it, the competition for finding people that could do the work was so high that businesses were offering anything they could to get you to come and work for them. And mm. FDR threatened wage caps. And the way they got to wear on those threatened wage caps was, okay, fine, we'll only pay you this much, but we'll give you benefits. And one of those benefits was comprehensive insurance. And that mm. was the beginning up until then, up until World War II, the cost of healthcare rose and fall with the general cost of living. Once they mm -hmm. introduced insurance, you started seeing, again, a decoupling. This All of a sudden, the cost of healthcare just kept kind of steadily going up. Mm -hmm. That led us into the 1960s, where an increasing number of poor people and elderly people simply could not afford the cost of insurance uh, or, or the cost of healthcare, which led to the creation of Medicare and Medicaid. And the problem with that is that now you have the government being one of the main uh, people that are both paying for it and negotiating pricing. 
the government pays $35,000 for a hammer. The government pays mm-hmm. $190,000 for a refrigerator. They intentionally pay more to justify their bloated budget so that every year when they go back to Congress or to you know whoever decides their budget, they go, look, we need more money. We got to buy all these hammers. It's the last people that you want making a decision for what things should cost. And mm-hmm. Medicare and Medicaid overnight made them the biggest single purchaser. Mm-hmm. And what we have seen, so then when Medicare and Medicaid happened, now that decoupling was even more intense. And you've seen uh, you know, Medicare Part D, uh, the Affordable Care Act, each new thing that Republicans and Democrats have added have continued to make it more and more expensive at the direct benefit of the cronies who run the system mm-hmm. at the direct cost of the rest of us. Now, for sure, the problem. So this means we can go one of two ways, because the argument becomes, well, who should be paying this big and growing bill? Should it be the taxpayer? Should it be us as individual patients? Should it be a pooled system, some hybrid system? We need to be talking about why the bill is so damn high to begin with and focus on that. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think you and I can can agree. And and you and and me and a lot of people on the left and, and a lot of people in general can agree. We know of regulations that exist right now whose sole true purpose is to drive up its cost. Oh, yeah. Let's go ahead ahead right now and just focus on getting rid of that stuff. And then that way, whether we decide to go to a Medicare for all type system Mm -hmm. or a national health care system or a completely wide open free market system or more than likely something in between, it's going to be more affordable. Yeah. It's going to be sustainable. It's going to be something we can afford. So like that's an example of how even on something that you and I in the if we get down into the granular aspect of how it should be run, we might disagree right on the on what we should be focused on right now, which is just getting government out of intentionally making it expensive. Mm-hmm. We can okay. work together even on that certificate mm-hmm. of need laws. Uh, getting rid of certificate of need laws, cost plus legislation, uh, looking at the the massive amounts of red tape behind the insurance system, something like oh, no doubt about that. Cost, yeah, forty percent of the cost of healthcare is just insurance compliance cost. Yeah, if we focus on dismantling as much of that as possible, then from there, with far less of a crisis on our hands and with a far more sustainable system, now we can take a more you know, with with our with having taken a nice deep breath and counting to ten, we can now take a deeper, more holistic look at what would a good healthcare system or a better healthcare system look like. But in the meantime, right now, people on the far left, people on on the libertarian right, people across the spectrum, uh, political spectrum, we could be working together right now on stuff that almost a hundred percent of a, of us agree on on healthcare. Exactly, and see, we've only discussed it for a little bit over ten minutes or so. But none of this dialogue was happening when CV19 started. So what happened on CV19? Everything was about the VAX. And I kept telling my liberal friends, to me, that was like a complete, like up to each person. And I still feel that way. That's what I'm saying. I have a lot of libertarian leanings, like Mm -hmm. not even knowing, like going into this. And then I realized, like, damn, I have a lot of these leanings, not even realizing (laughs) So I can be left quote unquote but still have libertarian leaning. absolutely so yeah and yeah, yeah. and this is one of the things a lot of my friends were you know they did their thing i was like nope i'm not doing that and i mean i took a lot of shit from it you know what i'm saying it took a lot oh, yeah. and now two years later it's almost like oh gosh let listen not talk about that conversation you know i don't want apologies or anything but it's just yep, crazy yep, yep. how the mindset's completely changed because oh so those power brokers told you that everything's okay now um, this is going to be our new normal now. So only until they told them and gave them the green light that they could think for themselves, that they yeah. decide, what does this have to do with the broken system that we have? We have a broken healthcare system. exactly. And so that avoided the issue of the broken healthcare system because we're arguing about Pfizer's top line or Glaxo Welcome Klein or any of these big pharmaceutical companies. Yep, yep, yep which is also tied to the anti-marijuana legislation. And yep. is, I don't know why people don't see these connections. And it's like, they're all designed like that. While we're here arguing about a product by the same people who you claim that you didn't like, but now you're advocating for their product and you're the salespeople. I remember when I used to think that the left might be a little too harsh on big pharma and that those days are <laughs> gone. Those days, buddy, I will watch 
I will say, hey, you know, is it not odd? And by the way, I'm not, I'm not against the 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 jab or whatever else. Like, right, 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 I think right. It is a, I think it's a personal choice to make. Um, I think the moment that we realized that it was not going to a, any argument that could have been made for trying to get, you know, trying to, you know, for lack of a better word, force people to make it, uh, to, to take it. Once it once we realized that it didn't stop community spread, that was really the end of it for me. Now it's mm -hmm. a personal choice. It, right. is, it it appears to be, especially for elderly people and for people with comorbidities, it, ap it appears, as far as I can tell, to be a safe and effective way to, to make it less likely for them to have a much harsher outcome. Fantastic. What a great thing that we have in our repertoire. But yes, it, it was it was obvious that this became about, now they're talking about giving it to kids, even though there are some ages where the likelihood of them having uh, uh, negative reactions to it, which is still rare, mm -hmm. but it's high higher than them actually getting hospitalized with the thing, mm -hmm. the actual thing that they're getting. It. So like, it's, it is, it is obvious to me that this is, you mentioned that, you know, it allowed them to sweep under the rug, the failures of the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. This is actually an example of the healthcare system. I think the one difference I would make with what you said is, and you probably agree with me on this. I don't call it a failure. This system is working as intended. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. No, especially yeah. when you talk about it the... fails to do what it yeah. says it's going to do, but it is <laughs> it is designed to maximize profits and the, the the actual patient be damned. In fact, if they do poorly, that actually again this goes back to why I don't like government trying to provide services. There is a mm. perverse incentive for their services to be bad because it makes us more dependent on them and it may, gives them an excuse to push for increasing their funding mm. or taking control from us. So it actually, in the, it, you know, as opposed to a, a mutual aid effort or a charitable effort where they have a vested interest in, in solving or, or at least ameliorating the problem so they can move on to the next thing. If your budget and your career and livelihood are determined on this problem getting worse, then yeah, there's a there's a perverse incentive to make the problem worse, and I I think healthcare is <laughs> yeah. a perfect example of that. No, no, I th that's um no, I agree that um the the public health crisis aspect of it, I don't I, I never thought once that the powers to, at B really cared about our health. I never yeah, yeah, yeah. in a million years thought that, but for some reason I don't know. I guess it's just operating from a different mindset when you don't. Mm -hmm follow the corporate news and you don't follow all the just the popular moment thing. I mean, everyone's got the Ukraine flags on their profiles <laughs> and say, like, what's going to be the next big thing. The I guess when you're thing. not caught up into that stuff, it's hard to um, you've already have your mind made up, but those people are just, you know, it's hard for them to change their mindset. Yep. yep absolutely. It is. And it's fear-based. That's another thing. Our government and, gov and the state in general wants us to live in a perpetual state of going from one crisis to the next, mm. right? I remember before 9-11 happened, they were literally trying to create a panic around shark attacks and whoever killed Chandra Levy might be trying oh. to, there might be more people <laughs> out killing more. And it was like, this is what, and then 9-11 happened. It is a constant, there's always the thing or the many things. Now it's monkeypox. Monkeypox. <laughs> monkey and uh, for mur for a minute, it was going to be the murder hornets. That didn't seem to, to, to pan out. But there's, always <laughs> this, there's always this crisis. And the problem is the corporate media plays a part in this as well. Mm -hmm. Because the corporate media is double dipping here. Number one, fear drives ratings. Fear and anger drives ratings mm -hmm. for news. So they make money there. But also... Uh, the corporation just so happens to have the cure or the fix. The oh yeah, or and and, and uh, that'll be our right? ad. You know, after we talk about this, here's our, here's the ad for that thing that will fix it. And Absolutely so, crazy. And and this is by the way, this is maybe something to discuss before we go, um, because a lot of times people will perceive libertarianism as being pro big corporation. That oh yeah, well, if the libertarians yeah. are in charge. The big corporations will just take over. Big mm. corporations are a client of the state. We have a corporatist system, and, and it's important to recognize that corporatism was is a term that was uh, that was coined by Benito Mussolini to describe the economic policies of fascism, the mm. idea of the merging of corporate entities with the state. Now, his idea was that it would, you know, the corporations and the state working together would just bring utopia to the land. Well, we <laughs> now have several decades of what that actually is, mm -hmm. what it is is a system whereby very powerful, wealthy people can use a government system 
to run up endless debt in our names to to give to them and use the the power, the enforcement power of the state to enforce their will against us. Now, what libertarians believe is that the problem isn't greedy people. They're always greedy people. Everyone has rational self-interest. The problem is the incentive. Mm -hmm. Having a system whereby you can just step up to a trough and get endless amounts of money and endless amounts of power, and all you have to do is make the right friends in the right powerful places, it creates an incentive for that to be the way for powerful people to become wealthier and more powerful. If you strip that away from them, that you don't have these mega corporations. What you have is endless competition because now the only way for them to become wealthy and powerful is to best serve us, the consumer. That's mm -hmm. how they get rich now is by bringing us the stuff we need better than anyone else does. It's mm -hmm. not a perfect, there is no perfect system, but right. that system, the, the people that want to be greedy and wealthy and the richest people on earth, now every day they wake up thinking, how can I best provide this service to the people so that I can make the most money. It's not because mm -hmm. they're suddenly angels. It's because now the incentive is on how can I serve the people right now? The incentive is on how can I get my favored politician into office and put the screws to him to make sure that I get what I want out of it. That's <laughs> the problem. But the problem with corporatism, it's less about the greed and it's more about the mechanism of the state power to be able to invert the, the percent of the, the um, incentive for how you make money. Um, so I, I say that the, the the free market ideas of libertarianism are that we basically use that greed for our benefit. Oh, you're greedy. You want to be a billionaire? Great. Mm. Make us all happy. So and that's and it. And if you don't, we'll make someone else a billionaire and, and you'll just have to be a millionaire because well, someone else will make us even happier. I've, I've, I've sort of accepted the fact, even though I mean, I guess I would identify as someone sort of threatened me, I would identify as an anti-capitalist, but at the same time, okay. I'm not silly that, like, I know that capitalism is not going anywhere at all. Like, I know that for a fact. It's not. Um, it's just a way to, like, what can we get done, you know? And my whole thing is, like, what can we get done now? And mm -hmm. um, it sounds like there are lots of things that can be just done right now with the stroke yep. of a pen. I don't know how you feel about um, student loan debt. I don't know your views on that. Personally, yeah. um, I think that that's a for-profit scam personally, like the way public ed education has been um, sort of just hijacked. And it seems like tuition is just going up higher and higher. I mean, I owe 140000 just in student debt. I just got my PhD and it's just, I'm saying to myself, it really takes a psychological toll on you knowing that you went, okay, I went to I public school K through 12 without paying anything. I went to college, you know, luckily my parents provided my first two degrees, but I was on my own after that. And I'm just like, wow, is this, was this worth it? This 150,000 yeah, in the hole? Yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah. do I get any credit for being an educator? It's just absolutely right. doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. So here, are, uh, the long story short on edu on higher education is they basically did to higher ed what they did to healthcare. They removed all of the price equilibriums by making it so that the government was the one paying for it. And so now you have situations, Harvard is sitting on something like an $80 billion trust. Like that's that bigger than most, they have more money in the bank than the U S government a does. <laughs> like it's a, it's not, well, it's not just a business. It's, it's the most, one of the most powerful businesses. It, it's certainly more money than most governments have. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's, it's, and here's why. If I let's say I'm the dean or or the person making decisions on on costs and tuitions at a at a university, but let's say I can't just go to the government and have them pay for everyone's tuition, I got to go to you, which means I can only get what you can afford. But then mm -hmm. if suddenly the government in the 1970s, which by the way, all of the main things that I'm talking about happened after Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard. And the reason why is because up until then, the government couldn't just print out five trillion notes and hand them off. Once they did that, now suddenly they could do everything. They could just spend money on everything. Mm -hmm. And this is actually an idea of modern monetary theory is, well, actually, okay, we, can MMT. Spend, we can just we can just spend money on everything. And at some point, we'll tax people. Well, putting aside the fact that you never actually raise the taxes enough because it's not popular, it also, that's not how it plays out. What it plays out is they end up just constantly, you know, uh, trying to, to catch the falling knife because they're just constantly throwing more money into the economy. So here, here's how this plays out with mm -hmm. higher education. 
in the 1970s, they started introducing the Pell Grants and, uh, and the, the, the uh, interest-free loans and all of this. And the idea was that, well, this will help people that need college tuition. Well, very quickly, what happened, this is going to sound very similar to our talk about healthcare. Suddenly, the government became the main person that was paying for tuition. So now mm. colleges, colleges weren't worried about what you as the student could afford. They now were worried about what the government could afford. See, if, if wow. I'm worried about what you as the student can afford, I want as many students paying what they're able to pay because that maximizes my the money I'm getting from my school, whether it's a nonprofit, for-profit, whatever, it doesn't matter. I need money. Schools need, you know, any organization needs money. And so uh, so now what happens is, well, yeah, I can keep, and, and again, you can see in the charts, when they started introducing Pell Grants and interest-free loans, all of a sudden the uh, rates went through the roof. Mm. The one thing that was controlling it was that you had private, privately underwritten loan companies that wouldn't give out loans because they'd look and they'd go, your loan's going to be way more than you could, you're going to be able, we can expect you're going to make in, in, in salary. You're never going to mm -hmm. be able to pay this back. We're not going to give the loan. That controlled somewhat. It helped keep the uh, the college uh, tuition somewhat under control. But then the government steps in and says, well, this isn't fair. You're not giving out loans to students who need it. So then with, uh, with a bill before Obamacare and then with the uh, reconcil uh, the reconciliation and Obamacare, then we had where the government all but nationalized the uh, college loan system. So now mm. they're giving out loans to everyone. Everybody. There is no underwriting. And that is when the, uh, that's when the tuitions got as dumb as they are now. And when now we have this like $2 trillion, whatever, $2 trillion student debt loan, student debt bubble, um, which will never be paid back. And I, I need to- No, it's not. People. It's not functionally- it's not economically possible to pay it back because they have intentionally driven up the cost of tuition to be well above what anyone could reasonably expect to be able to make and pay back in that given profession for all but a handful of professions. And it's actually getting so high now that even doctors aren't expecting to be able to pay it back, which is now causing a healthcare crisis because people aren't becoming doctors anymore. We're mm -hmm. now having a doctor and nursing shortage. This is as a direct result of the government trying to help by getting involved mm. and making economically illiterate decisions, which I frankly think they knew what was going to happen, but let's let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they thought they were doing the right thing. We now have the benefit of decades to show us that when the government tries to help, really what they do is they skew the incentives, they remove price equilibriums, and they drive the cost up through the roof and make it where all of the problems that we're facing now. So the question becomes, okay, great, we can get rid of that stuff and we can drive down the cost, but what about people that already have this kind of debt? Number one, and you, you may already know this, but a, a lot of people have discovered this. It is almost impossible to be able to get your debt discharged in uh, in bankruptcy court. You can literally mm -hmm. go bankrupt, and the 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 uh, the the court system has created uh through, and it's through the courts. This isn't even legislation. This is the courts that made this decision, uh, and it's a tarot. It's a, it's up there with qualified immunity. It oh is wow! A, uh, it, yeah, it is that they basically, and I forget the wording that they use, but basically the the uh, threshold for your ability to pay is so high when it comes specifically to student loan debt, you can literally file bankruptcy, have every other debt discharged, and they won't even reduce your student loan debt. Like that's how that's how bad that is. So I think the first thing we need to allow is if someone is it, 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 at the very least needs to be discharged, uh, in the uh, it be able to be discharged at the same level as any other consumer debt, because that's what it is. It is an unsecured consumer debt. It should have always been treated that way in the court system. That would deal with a major bulk of that. Uh, mm -hmm. I also think that we need to have a much easier system of discharging student debt for people who ended up uh, not completing or dropping out, because you have a lot of people, I think it's something like 30 or 40% of students Easily. who dropped out in the first like year or two so they got, and again, you think, you think about 17, 18 year old kids that are signing up for, for mortgage, the equivalent of a mortgage. They couldn't even get a mortgage. They couldn't even get a car loan. They couldn't even drink. They, they got like, <laughs> uh, you think of all the things they're not allowed to do because it's recognized that they don't quite have the maturity yet uh, uh, to the, I would argue some of those things they should be allowed to do, but if they're not allowed to drink, maybe don't let them sign a quarter million dollar note on yeah. an, an unsecured note on something. Right. So, uh, I, so that's something that needs to be looked at. So there are a lot of things that can be done to deal with it. Uh, I also would not be opposed to having, 
uh, and it would have to be on, on a case by case basis, but especially in the situations of students that have been, that have dropped out, um, that, uh, to have, to have that either, uh, either forgiven or just discharged in the, in the bankruptcy system. Here's why I'm not a fan of the, um, of, of just full student loan forgiveness. There are a lot of people who can pay off their loans and mm -hmm. it may not be the easiest thing on earth, but they can pay it off. And then there are other people who didn't go to college and they're just, you know, blue collar workers making a living who will essentially have to pay off the college debts of people who can't afford to pay it. And that, mm -hmm. that's, that's my problem with, with that is that it creates new victims uh, in, in trying to deal with these victims right. it creates new victims that weren't involved. So I'm not in favor of a, a full uh, uh, forgiveness. What I'm in favor of is first of all, fixing the problems uh, so that you, and, and another big thing is getting rid of so much of this occupational licensing that requires you to go to school to do stuff like braiding hair and, <laughs> yeah. and, hair and stuff like that. That's mm -hmm. a big part of it too. But, um, but with the existing student loan, I think one of the biggest, most powerful things that we could do is just allow it to be discharged, just discharged more easily in the court system. And really as easily as it's being discharged, other types of, 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 uh, of loan debt, predatory loan debt. I think we also should be looking at some of the practices and there, there may be some situations where some companies just have to forgive it on their own because it was predatory how they even did it in the first place. I think that would alleviate a lot of that. And again, moving forward, put the price equilibrium back in the actual pricing of higher education, I think would be a, a great way to fix it. Yes, I know. Spike, I tell you, I hate to cut this short. We have to go um, like within the next few minutes, but I love this this whole forum as far as like bringing the platform in so people can kind of hear the ideas from the person. I think we have too much of this, um, too many assumptions about, um, I don't want people to be mis, you know, represented. I like people to have their own views and, you know, coming onto the show. And I learned so much that way. Like everyone can learn that way. Sometimes it's just right. best to sit back and listen to things, jot down notes, You've made me sort of, um, I've had to rest with this idea of what is government for so long now, I think, <laughs> like, what exactly is it, you know, what and that's it? why I yeah, asked you yeah, that yeah. question, because it does make me think, I mean, it does, it, it, it makes me think more and more and more about that, but it may be a good thing down the road, because it may be a better way to sort of connect to, you know, different um, groups, you know, to sort of accomplish similar goals. I think we could definitely do a lot together, like those sort of mentalities. Absolutely. Um, and hopefully people can take that approach going forward. How can people reach out to you if they wanted to message you directly? Yeah, I know you probably have a high social media presence. Sure, absolutely. First of all, I agree with you 100%. I think these kinds of discussions are absolutely crucial because the ruling class would love nothing more and my dog apparently would also love nothing more <laughs> than for us to make assumptions about each other operate on those assumptions and just not associate with each other or argue with each other instead of saying, hey, why don't we take a second and see if there's anything we agree on and mm -hmm. then move out from there. And you know what? Maybe we find out we don't agree. Maybe we find out we do. Whatever we find out, at least we're operating in a more peaceful way. And, and when I say peaceful, I mean, we're actually building a discord discourse that's built on trying to serve us as best as possible, as opposed to really servicing the, the the ruling class for sure so I think it's really important to have these kinds of discussions and i and i, I really I, i'm happy to have the opportunity thank you for tolerating this absolute no no as i've been he uh he usually is, is with my <laughs> wife but he uh he's having a moment but um yeah so my social media uh if you look for me uh on all social media i'm spike cohen you can find me on facebook youtube twitter instagram uh i'm on tiktok for the kids um, and, uh, uh, if you want to get a part, be a part of, you are the power of the organization we were talking about, uh, membership is free. We would love to have, uh, everyone, you, including Kiko, everyone be a part of it. If you go to, you are the power.net, you can find out more about what we're doing. You can sign up. You can get, as soon as you sign up, we get you onboarded right away to become a part of the grassroots army for human liberty. That's fighting across the country. Uh, we're liberating communities one at a time, uh, actually multiples at a time across the country, one issue at a time. And we invite you to join us. You are the power.net. And again, I thank you, Kiko. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And this uh, Kiko's Free Thinker Swarm is really kicking off. Um, I'm kind of surprised by the reaction and just um, the cordiality of the guest and just like the generousness of everybody. And 
hopefully for season two, we can have you back on. That'd be great. I look forward to it, man. Thank you so much. Well, you have a great day and goodbye, beautiful people. Have a nice day.